I care deeply about knowledge exchange and I also am really interested in culture and the culture in universities that supports this work and really delighted that we've got such a fabulous panel today. I don't know, Jess, whether you could just bring the slide up again that shows who will be speaking. We've got basically 90 minutes um, and it's going to be quite a structured conversation. We're going to start with just working out what we're talking about with knowledge exchange culture and, and why it is a topic that we need to think about. We're going to then look at the experience the panel have had in improving KE culture. And then we will be looking ahead just to, to get us going, just a, a handful of slides. The first one is uh, yeah, research culture. I just mentioned is something that lots of people are talking about. And this definition of, of research culture encompassing the behaviors, values, expectations, attitudes and norms of our research communities. It influences research's career paths determines the way that research is conducted and communicated. I think that's a that's a good start, but we're not talking about research culture today. We're talking about knowledge exchange culture. And what is knowledge exchange culture? Well, where better to look than the KE Concordat uh, for a definition of some of the principles of what supporting excellent knowledge exchange looks like. So the next slide shows just a quick reminder of the eight principles um, and the Concordat was set up, I think, to give universities, staff, students a clarity of mission that allows them to succeed in knowledge exchange in a supportive environment. And these eight facets, these eight principles um, underpin how the KE Concordat expresses what KE culture is. And then finally, just personally speaking, the public engagement centre that I um, have been involved in for 15 years when we were set up back in 2008. It wasn't that common to talk about culture and research culture, but our mission from our funders was to change the culture of UK higher education to ensure that public engagement is more effectively supported. And so the next slide, Jess, I think shows a tool we developed all those years ago that we call the EDGE tool, which is a self-assessment tool, which has a lot of similarities to the KE principles, you know, sort out your purpose, get your processes working well and make sure you're engaging people effectively. So just three examples of, of what KE culture might be. Before I invite you to share what your thoughts are on the Padlet, I just wanted to point out there's a man called Sam Holland in brackets live scribe at the top of our screen. And Sam is here today to help us um, by visualizing our conversation. So as well as having a verbal conversation, we're going to come to Sam periodically over the next 90 minutes for his attempt to capture the essence of what we've been describing. So no pressure, Sam, and thank you so much for joining us from Plymouth. That's great. I'm going to turn to Amanda first to just ask for her to introduce herself and to explain to us what she thinks knowledge exchange culture is. Hi, thanks, Paul. Uh, my name is Amanda Selvaratnam. I'm the Associate Director of Research, Innovation and Knowledge Exchange at the University of York, and I look after the business of K activities. Uh, so rather like um, others who've spoken already, my, my whole career, or at least certainly the last kind of 25, 30 years, has been around KE, even before KE was a was a discipline or a, an area. Um, I've always worked in this sort of environment. And I, and I think for me, K culture is about something that is embedded through the kind of almost the very DNA of your own organization where it becomes second nature to be always thinking about how we exploit, promote, engage with the external communities. So kind of whatever we're doing, we're always thinking within the institution. I'm not saying this happens at York yet. Um, but the idea is that whatever we're doing within our, our research or teaching environments is all about what is the impact that that's going to have and how can I make sure that what we're doing does have an impact, a positive impact on, on society, on the economy, et cetera, et cetera. So to me, I, th I think it really does matter because if we don't have that right at the centre of our ethos about we're doing this for, for good, um, then I think we can be very, become very inward looking um, and less aware of what we're doing and the impact it makes on others around us. So, so for me, the whole thing about helping the university develop its knowledge exchange culture is about building that 
um, perception and understanding within the university that whatever we're doing, we're always looking for an eye to the outside and how, how what we're doing will have a positive impact. Great. And Amanda, is it a cheeky question to ask you, how good do you think the KE culture is at York? It's definitely improved. Um, I think there's still issues. Language for us is the biggest hurdle to ha we have to overcome. So a lot of people don't like the term knowledge exchange. And I think to me, just getting over that hurdle of it doesn't really matter what we call it. This is about culture. And, and very often culture doesn't have a name. Um, it's about how you do things. So for me, we're getting there. It's much more accepted in some faculties than others. Um, but the biggest hurdle is trying to make the terms resonate with people by explaining it in ways that they engage with. Great. Thank you very much. Martin, how about you? Would you introduce yourself and reflect on the topic? Yeah, thanks very much, Paul. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Martin Davis, Vice Chancellor for Knowledge Exchange Innovation at Kingston University. Um, so it's like Amanda, I've been sort of, you know, reflecting on, on this question you know, and, and sort of being engaged in, in a whole range of different roles across different types of institutions in different parts of the sector the last 20 or 20 more years, 25 or, or even more years, more years than I care to mention. Um, uh, obviously, uh, in, in current roles, responsible for kind of institutional strategy and organisation of our resources. And you think about the, the policies and, and the practices you have to encourage knowledge exchange. Um, uh, in previous institutions, you know, setting up and running KE teams and so on, but also uh, involved right back in the, you know, perhaps uh, mid to late 90s, early 2000s in, in research and, and academic roles as well. When, again, as Amanda was also saying, it, it wasn't called knowledge exchange then, but it was, you know, industrial collaboration or perhaps we were starting to call it knowledge transfer. Um, but that certainly shaped my uh, views and experience and, and why I think knowledge exchange is important and, and what we need to do to uh, encourage it. It's really all about a culture of, of, of sharing, of being open to the world, of being, using that word we sometimes use as institutions, porous, um, being prepared to have your preconceptions challenged to an extent and therefore to learn from that. And you can learn that from that through... Um, uh, you know, uh, an individual collaborative project with an industry partner. And I, I learned a lot through doing that in my early days when I was working on TCS programs, as they were then. So that sort of dates it and dates me a bit. Um, but learned an awful lot from observing how industry partners would take research from sort of the lab and apply a whole different set of criteria to what they thought was important, which was different to what we thought as researchers. But that was really, really an eye-opener. And I've used, used that a lot in, in, in developing further programmes, just to look, look at things through the eyes of the perspective of, of your, your collaborator. So if you then scale up in, at an institutional level, knowledge exchange culture is about always being prepared to, to, to have that external voice brought into your own, uh, your own decision making. So you could say that, in, in, for me, um, a knowledge exchange culture, surely, I would argue, is the culture of a university. You have to be open, you are being influenced by the world, you want to understand the world, you want to shape it, but equally you want to understand how the world uses your research, uh, uses your educational uh, output, uh, and, and together um, uh, develop uh, new things, break down barriers, solve problems. Great. Rory, how about you? Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, hi, everybody. So I'm uh, Rory Duncan, Provost Chancellor for Research and Innovation at Sheffield Hallam uh, right now. Um, and until about um, 18 months ago, in my previous job, I, I was Director of Talent and Skills with UKRI. Um, and that was a really interesting thing for me to do because I spent almost all of my adult life working in universities. Um, and within itself um, was obviously very interesting, which is kind of why we're all here. But moving out of the, the, the I guess, constraints of university and looking across the whole sector was a huge um, I guess, opportunity and learning experience for me. And part of the work that I did at that time was uh, working with a large team of extremely dedicated, talented people on something called the R&D People and Culture Strategy, which I'm sure many people on the call will have heard of. Um, this was published in 2021, um, and it was led by um, someone called Amanda Soloway, who was the then science minister. Now, Amanda Soloway's 
uh, doesn't have a research background, which is pretty common for a minister of science. Uh, Amanda Soloway um, originally came from HR. She's an HR professional. And she was going out and about on tours and so on, smelling wet paint, as these people usually do when they go around new labs. Um, and she was hearing stories from people all the time, which were along the lines of, and I'll be very polite about it, uh, particularly academic research careers are not as attractive as they could be. And there are all sorts of reasons for that that we could touch on today. Early career precarity, very high levels sometimes of bullying and harassment, uh, lack of, uh, I guess, support, understanding, lack of diversity. There are all sorts of challenges. And these have been around for a really long time. And just simply uh, a minister commissioning a strategy and a review of that, in my view, was a really big step. And it had followed on from, as we all know, many decades of uh, people raising these issues. And in my view, they're becoming more and more acute. Um, there are people on the call who already in the Padlet, I think, have been able to define KE culture, research culture, in a much more succinct, articulate way than I can. Uh, but I think for me, uh, one of my one of my, I guess, um, original go-to things that I look at to understand this is a review that was published, I've got it right in front of me, in 2014, so a really long time ago, um, by Nuffield Council on Bioethics, entitled The Culture of Scientific Research in the UK. And it highlights a whole bunch of different issues and problems ahead of the R&D People and Culture Strategy. Everything in there is in the R&D People and Culture Strategy and remains uh, completely appropriate to where we are today. So progress is, is really quite slow. I think the thing which is for me really interesting about this is, I think, I'm not entirely sure, but I think this is the first usage of the term research culture. And the person who chaired that review and who led the recommendations was Ottoline Leiser, who's now the chief executive of, obviously, UK Research and Innovation. So it's a really interesting review to have a look at. Um, finally, for me, I'll pause in a second. Um, writing um, very high-level strategies, drafting high-level strategies on a sector level, as I said, was a great opportunity and a huge learning curve, very steep learning curve for me. Coming back into the university sector, particularly, I think, in a modern university where I am now, and trying to put those strategies into action, implement them, is a much steeper learning curve. Um, once you actually encounter real politic and understand challenges that organisations are facing in the present environment, then you see where the issues really come from. And I think that's something that we all need to pay attention to. Yeah. Thank you, Rory. And Anne, welcome. Um, great to see you here. Again, a, a quick introduction and then just some reflections on this question, please. Um, uh, I'm Anne Bonington. I'm uh, currently Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Knowledge Exchange at uh, Middlesex University. Um, and prior to that, was Pro Vice Chancellor at uh, Kingston. So um, for the same thing, or actually something similar. Um, so that's what I, I do. I also chaired a ref panel and did a few other bits and pieces in my in my life. Retired a couple of times and came back into the sector because I can't leave it alone. Um, so uh, the real kind of interest for me, and I, I come from a design background. I'm an architect by training, professor of design innovation. Um, is I am I'm not completely convinced we can actually design culture. What I think we can do. I mean, I think we should think culture is about people to people people to systems relationships so it's about people fundamentally and i'm interested in people i'm interested in academic careers and i'm interested in the careers of others that work in universities that are often not acknowledged so i that's my go-to place now and the thing i'm most interested in so what i'm interested in is how practically and it's to rory's point really how practically we actually make a difference in doing that the real politic the real politic is hard and it's hard because currently knowledge exchange is not equally recognized in reward and recognition structures or promotion structures in the same way that research is research is seen as a kind of the, the kind of gold standard and everything else secondary to it and i'm going to put that right out there now it's something i've spent a long time looking at and i'm 
Also really fascinated by how through knowledge exchange, i.e. dialogue inside and outside an institution, looking at, at porosity, is how we actually make the kind of messy world of research even messier by taking it into the world and kind of seeing what happens to it when we do. Um, and that all those perfect experiments don't look quite the same when you take them out and present them to other people. Um, but what we don't do and what we haven't allowed, and this would be my challenge for today probably, is to think about how people move in and out of universities, how people can come in and work with us um, inside an institution, but also how academics don't spend 35 years, 40 years inside an academic institution and get out occasionally. I, I can assure you it's very good for you. Um, and it's a real, really nice thing to work between those two things, um, between those two environments and, um, and bring the real world a little bit closer in and, and take, take our world outside. Both are exciting and both have an opportunity, uh, give us opportunities. Be enough. Thank you, Anne. And just going back to the Padlet before we, we come to Tim, I think one of the really in, important points that people are making on the Padlet is this is so much more than academic activity. This is about the whole cohort of professional staff within universities who support it. But equally, it's, it's also something that our partners have a huge stake in um, because the kind, as Martin was reflecting, the disjunction between academic expectations and some of the partners he was working with threw into relief how our culture perhaps is really inhibiting of really good interaction and engagement. But the role of technicians, the role of knowledge exchange professionals, public engagement professionals, professional staff, all of us uh, are in the mix here. The reason our panel, I think, today is, is probably more senior to academic decision makers was a choice that we made because we felt that actually these are people who are having to try and implement culture and have got a lot of experience of what does and doesn't work, but equally perhaps can help us look to the future. But I think there's probably future conversations where we need to bring a broader range of people who experience culture into the room, uh, not least you know, young academics who are finding their feet, etc. But anyway, Tim, how about you? You've just returned from Kuala Lumpur, so thank you for, for making this a priority. No, no, it's great to be here. So, um, yeah, I'm Tim Vorley. Uh, I'm at Oxford Brooks University. Uh, I'm Pro Vice Chancellor with responsibility for enterprise and entrepreneurship, but also the, the Dean of the Business School, which is uh, an interesting dynamic in any conversation around knowledge exchange, um, where we really should be crucibles of engagement in business schools. But I think we do that more and less successfully uh, in different areas. I, I guess the other kind of hat that I wear is as um, a beneficiary of um, quite a substantive UKRI Innovate UK funded project, which is a, a KE project in nature. Um, and it's really kind of working to try and support the development and, and really the curation of the research and innovation ecosystem in the UK. So I, I will say a bit more about that later. Um, I've also been fortunate enough under Rory to serve under the talent and skills panel uh, with UKRI and continue to to sit on on that, um, and also the ESRC Strategic Advisory Network. So these are forums which the kind of the key questions are, are well rehearsed, and I think the the questions are, but perhaps the answers aren't where we need them yet. And I think a really opportun good opportunity for further development. I, I guess on the kind of question of, of why I care and um, what this kind of culture means to me is. Um, I've always considered myself throughout my career to be an engaged academic, and I, I, I've had to ad hoc that definition throughout the career and change it as the path that I've taken as as change to fit the opportunity. And it genuinely is changing the path to fit the opportunity rather than following the path as it was laid out. Um, at the um, graduation I was at on on Saturday in Kuala Lumpur, I did say to the the graduates that from this point, it is about making a path, not taking one. And I think when it comes to KE in this environment, that actually um, we're all making it up. I think that we learn from each other, but actually KE is not something where there is a, a kind of a standard route and path that is easily followed. Um, so on the question of KE culture, I suppose that I, I'm the kind of the, the, the needle here, which is that I don't know if KE culture is is the answer i don't know if there is ke culture i think um it was martin who talked about the institutional piece i think that ke is a is another facet of the university it's another expectation 
um, another kind of role that we play as academics individually, but also that our institutions um, look for us to play. And there's this classic Peter Drucker quote, which is around how culture eats strategy for breakfast. Well, I've seen many um, KE strategies, but the KE culture is something that um, is still a, a work in progress. And certainly I think that it, it works at an institutional level, that progress. But it also is how it is enacted and developed. And, and being a dean of a business school, um, something that we're very much trying to look to develop that culture, um, but not as something that is distinct from research culture or teaching culture. Um, it's about having that excellence where we see engagement become embedded with teaching and research and research and teaching become embedded with engagement. Um, and I think from that perspective, um, thinking about engagement as strategy is a really interesting question and in how we move that forward. So um, I think that we are moving in a really positive direction. I think that um, we are trying to go beyond the strategy point and that is being enacted through culture. But that culture is, of course, something that's dependent upon the colleagues and actually um, universities as coalitions of individuals collectively. And I, I agree with um, the point that Anne made that it's hard to design culture, but we can do more to curate it. And I think that progression, thinking about how we facilitate that incentives, opportunities um, and what that means for individual academics and the alignment with the institutions that they're part of, um, especially as people move through their careers, I think it's really important that the question of fit and, and contribution becomes um, something that is really important. So, uh, yeah, um, really looking forward to the, the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Tim. And uh, Sam, I'll be coming to you just in a minute to see where you've got to. But yes, and thank you for needling us. And I love the idea of, um, of the need for engagement as strategy rather than going down rabbit holes of KE culture and teaching culture and research culture. But actually what you're suggesting is this is a strategic imperative to be better at engaging, whether with students, with through our knowledge exchange, through our research. And the more we think about that in a holistic way, the better. So, yeah, very helpful. So, Sam, tell us just a little bit about your role at Plymouth. Yeah, great. So I just finished my master's in illustration, just finished in July. Um, and for the past year, I've been working with the University of Plymouth um, doing live scribing um, at most of their conferences, um, a few webinars and seminars. And essentially what live scribing aims to do is to basically create a visual representation of the conversations that are kind of being facilitated. Um, so it's not about trying to capture everything, but rather trying to capture key points within a discussion um, through sort of playful imagery and sort of recognisable um, iconography. Um, and that's right. basically live scribing. Can we have a look over your shoulder? Fantastic. Do you want to just talk us through what you've seen or heard? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we'll start with uh, Amanda here. Um, I thought it was quite interesting to sort of talk about how sort of knowledge exchange is kind of embedded, embedded in the DNA um, of universities. And it's that, about building the understanding of KE cultures universities. So we've got a little um, hammer here with some bricks. Um, but also addressing that la uh, language is the biggest hurdle. So we've got... Um, letter of the alphabet trying to leap over the hurdle, a um, bit more of a metaphorical approach. Um, Martin was talking about how K culture is about sort of um, challenging your preconceptions as well, as well as being able to learn from them. Um, you know, you sort of, you have so many different people involved with um, K culture. It's, in, it's important to sort of be mindful and open um, to all suggestions, um, but also helping you sort of understand how the world responds to your research. Um, with Rory, they were talking about how sort of putting strategies into action is quite difficult. And it can be quite a difficult process to try and um, try and push that forward. Um, I really liked what Anne was talking about and how it's about the people um, first and foremost. And how you're talking about how it's hard to design culture. Um, and what Tim was saying is that it's hard to design culture, but you can curate it. Um, so it's about people. Um, key culture um, deserves to be rec more recognized. And uh, I really like what Anne said about how do people make uh, research even messier. So we have a bunch of research papers that are kind of scattered all over the um all over the floor um and then for tim as well um i really liked what he said regarding about not following your path but creating your own which i think is quite an important thing um especially for myself as a recent graduate i'm now sort of in that sort of limbo phase where i'm trying to find my destination um and so in, in terms of like trying to sort of carve a path i think that's a really important thing um so yeah that's a very quick summary of what i've just captured and listened into thank you sam we're going to move on now to just think a bit more about 
how to improve KE culture. We've, I think, got some sense that it's a complex thing to even begin to, to understand, but what can you do to improve KE culture? So a very practical question, and we will come back to the panel in a second, but we just wanted to check in with you all about how you feel the KE culture in your institution, if you are based in an, in an institution that does knowledge exchange, to just check in with you how valued you think KE culture actually is. So we've got a Mentimeter poll that I think, Jess, you'll you'll bring up for us now. I think this picks up perhaps, Amanda, what you were saying earlier about the fact that, yes, we're getting there. But it, this, this is work in progress. But it's good. It's good. I'm optimistic. It's above two and a half. <laughs> it suggests we're definitely heading in the right direction. So yeah, a rather um, a rather playful and not particularly robust um, attempt to assess KE culture across the UK. But um, the challenge now for for our panel, and I think maybe this time I'll I'll just swap it around a bit. Maybe and Martin come to you first, and then to Anne. We just wondered if you could reflect if you've been involved in that has attempted to shift KE culture and. What did you do? What was the rationale for it? And what, what did you learn? Did it work? And things I, I, I've, as a tool, I've often used to sort of um, keep that culture moving forward and developing over the years of different things I've been involved in, both here at Kingston and previous roles before Kingston, I was UCL, and then before that at University of Greenwich, and then some other, other university networks around London, is um, sort of the role of innovation networks, if you like, a bit of a a bit of a buzz phrase, but I sort of use the analogy of thinking about, um, again, more, more buzz phrases here, like what's an enterprising ecosystem look like? And if, um, say, you are in um, government and governments think about enterprise and ecosystems and economies all the time, which are, you know, hundreds of thousands of interactions every day of people making you know, micro decisions about what they're going to do or not do. But governments try to use policy levers and funding um, investment in different bits of the skills and educational system in trying to create a, an environment for more investment to come in, to create more businesses, to encourage entrepreneurship or whatever it might be when you think about a, 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 a very large ecosystem like an economy. And I sort of take that analogy and apply it to an extent, it's a bit of a, it doesn't always work to extent, to university ecosystem so again you know in in sort of the role you think about okay do we have the right sort of incentives for staff you know are there promotional pathways that are clear in in the career development that's that is available um are we well connected with our external communities and so on well, those are all, all all necessary but not sufficient in their own right so i'm always very keen also on the role of networks innovation networks to bring people together and to create the space where random things can happen. As Anne was saying earlier, you, know, you can't necessarily design the culture, but you can perhaps put in place some things where self-directed design can happen. So that's the role of innovation networks. And you can put a bit of formal, formal structure around them, but these are very key to have those random collisions happen for people to share good practice, ideas, innovation happens through people talking, building rapport, um, sharing ideas, it's a social phenomenon, phenomenon, it's a social thing. You need to have social networks for, for, ears to, for, for ideas to spread and have that sense of openness we, we've spoken about. So a couple of examples put in, in, into place. Um, I mean, going back a few years now when I was involved with a consortium of universities based around East London, and this was the time when Hefke, as they were at the time, remember them, uh, were funding Centres for Knowledge Exchange. Well, I, was, I was running one of those with an East London group. There happened to be a West London group as well, uh, which also included, quite coincidentally, Kingston, where I'm now based. But we worked together, there was about 14 universities working together across London with some, some funding we got from the, the then London Development Agency to set up something which became called Knowledge London. And this was a network for anyone, anyone involved in knowledge transfer, as we called it at the time, um, in, in London. So a lot, a lot of the membership were knowledge transfer professionals, and I imagine a lot of people on the call here are perhaps in those roles. But also we had a very good membership from academics and also PhD students. And the purpose of Knowledge London was, was, was to be that space where these random collisions could happen. We would obviously curate and organise through particular events on topics of interest. But it's very important to have not just those formal ways of trying to create a culture with funding, incentives, policy. But you've got to have some sort of 
other thing to lubricate and make the whole system work and to create a sense of goodwill, which I think is really important to grow any kind of, of cult. You've got to have a, a, a sense of goodwill. You want to grow the pool of goodwill, and that's what we rely on for people to do things which are over and above what might just be written into their contracts. Great. Martin, thank you. And uh, Again, that echoes some of the things that came through in the Padlet, but this idea of a, a curiosity-driven kind of collaborative culture that is kind of people-centred seems to be a truth that is coming across from from lots of people and i suppose one of my observations when i joined the university sector again after working at the bbc for a long time was how little of that i i experienced 15 years ago watching how universities work where that approach of sharing knowledge being very curious about what the knowledge means outside the university having the space to develop new creative approaches to to, to our work seem to be quite limited in universities compared with what I was used to in other sort of perhaps more cultural sectors but I'm sure that's changing and has changed a lot and how would you sort of answer the question you know what have you done to try and improve KE culture and has it worked um well I hope it has um I, I, there's probably a test to be had yet um but the first thing the, the challenge I'd put out there is is really to build on on a lot of what's already been said, which is if you actually look at how much time is invested, how much training or how much reward and recognition there is for KE, and you compare it with research, it's minimal at the best. It might be that KE is um, conflated with practice or it's conflated with citizenship and engagement. And the problem is there are no criteria against which you measure KE or very few places where you can actually get um, KE criteria for reward recognition and promotion. So people will be on a sometimes called a KE route, um, except that when you look at the KE route, it's as woolly as they come and nobody knows what to put in the promotion application. Um, and that's one of the challenges that I think we face is if you if you're in charge of which people like myself um, and Rory are in charge of things like track returns and all of those sorts of bits where you look at the relative investment in the universities and how training and development works. KE isn't supported in the same way. It is supported in little bits. And, and Martin gave some really good examples of where, you know, you can set up kind of conditions for that to happen. But why would academics do it if if what they've got to really do is pretend to be researchers? And that's the question that I keep coming back to, is that they end up dressing it up as something else because that's the way they get a professorship. And if you look at the career structure, it's you don't see professors of KE. You see lots and lots of research professors. That's the that's the gold standard kind of, you know, I've made it moment. But actually, there are very few, which, apart from a professor of practice, um, which is often secondary to a, prof a, a research professor. So one of the things I spent a long time at, actually at Kingston, first of all, I've done it in, in a number of places since, is to look at the criteria and, and career frameworks that allow people to, for example, have a teaching and KE um pathway or 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 route for a period of time they might move from teaching and ke to teaching and research they might move from teaching and research to teaching and ke but you've got to allow people to be able to, to do that and you've got to be able to reward and recognize from postdoc to people like me and, and that career structure needs to be there that's what i've spent the last probably the last five six years of my life and career um, doing is to say, how do we make those things equitable? How do we reward and recognize them? And what do they look like when we do? And what's the evidence base for doing that? And until I think we invest like that, we're, it's always going to be secondary to being a researcher or even now being a good teacher. I mean, teaching's had its own challenges and the whole education space has had its own challenges for, for the same reason. But I do think we have to see it as equal and equitable in terms of how we reward, recognize and support. And, and that way we start to build the porosity we need, which says you can go out into the world and be in industry for a while. You can come back in. You can, you can invite people in and we can, we can um, allow people to go out and come back in. And it can't be beyond the wit of 
institutions to do that, but it seems to be so at the moment, or not as not as flexible as it might be. So that would be my provocation, but also um, what I've done to kind of shape it. And, and Kingston's got a version of that career framework. I think the other last thing I'd probably say is the narrative CV is quite useful in that regard. So if you take the narrative CV and combine it with a much more flexible idea of a career framework rather than pathways, I think we'll probably get closer um, to where I, I suspect Ottoline would like to take UK or I. Yeah, great. Thank you, Anne. And I think, uh, gosh, what you've talked about is is how this work is valued within the, the university. But there's there's a comment in Q&A that, that sort of seems very relevant to me. In my institution, I feel that the challenge is the emphasis that the institution puts on KE value being primarily in it as a money-making vehicle. This is not conducive to development of more positive cultural feeling amongst academics. So that seems to be another kind of cultural barrier in terms of, of academic perceptions of, of what KE is. Yeah. So. Um, Porosity. You mentioned porosity, and Rory Duncan talks about porosity a lot. <laughs> and he's even brought some slides about <laughs> porosity. <laughs> How can yeah. I resist the cue? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It is a bit of a cue. I'm just, I'm still reeling from the fact that that um, Anne said I might be responsible for track returns. So I actually need to go <laughs> off and check that now because it's something I didn't know I was. Anyway, um, Martin talked a little bit about. Um, just, I guess, trying to enable random collisions to happen. Anne's been talking about uh, people and pathways and all of those sorts of things. And I think these things are quite closely linked to culture. And I've got a couple of slides, or it's just one slide, but there's a cheat because there's a transition that might help illustrate this. So <clears throat> this is, I, I use this quite a lot. And, and this is effectively, if you consider who is doing research and uh, who's doing knowledge transfer in HE in a university, um, normally, this is somebody's career pathway. So they obviously go to school. Um, obviously, they do well at school. Then, by and large, go to university. Most people in UK universities engaged in research have a PhD. So they've obviously done well and they've done a PhD at some point. And then researchers particularly very often follow this quite narrow career pathway. So then Anne's already mentioned postdocs. They do a postdoc. Some people might get a fellowship. That's something that I was fortunate enough to do. And then ultimately the holy grail of a permanent position in the university. And there's a huge amount of rightful angst over this at the moment because in the UK, we currently have at any one time something like 100,000 people engaged in, in, in the pursuit of a PhD, and there will never, ever be enough jobs in academia rightly for those people. So we need to break out of the notion that we're training academics, first of all. Um, but wouldn't it be great if we could just think more broadly, if you could just go to the next bit, please, Jess, um, about this and, and help people understand that with the skills that they have, there is a huge career landscape that they could follow. And Anne has talked once or twice um, in, in a little speech just now about wouldn't it be great if people could go away for a little bit of time, work somewhere else, and then come back. And so this this hideous diagram here is is really trying to illustrate some of those wider opportunities, entrepreneurial opportunities, working in the public or the third sector, uh, working in industry, perhaps, you know, having a career break or whatever. And um, Anne said that this seems to be very hard for universities to achieve. I think it's worthwhile thinking about two things here. The first thing is, in the first slide, there's a very, very narrow career pathway. Universities, by and large, I think, are the only sector where people join at 18 and never leave. And that, <laughs> that, that in turn creates quite an unusual working culture, um, which can often be based on survivor bias. Um, so it was bad for me, so it's going to be bad for you. Um, and that is quite corrosive. This is all set out in the people and culture strategy and other people's thinking um, for, a, for, for a very long period of time, much smarter people than me. The second thing is, Actually doing this has a huge number of benefits. Um, I was part of uh, recently, um, in the last couple of months, um, the National Centre for Universities and Business, NCUB Mobility Task Force, 
It's always good to be part of a task force. It sounds really important. And we were looking at how to enable this type of mobility. And there are all sorts of reasons for doing it. But if you look up NCAB Mobility Task Force, you'll find a data set there, which is really, really helpful because there are all sorts of benefits for organizations, universities, external organizations, but primarily for people in mobility. And then the final thing that makes this, or has until quite recently, and I'm probably slightly cautious to even say the ref word at the moment, um, but the thing which has hindered this up until recently has actually been the ref. Inadvertently, government policy, I think inadvertently, government policy has uh, disincentivized universities and therefore people from being mobile. And by that, it's perfectly easy to understand. But if if you're an academic and the thing which is being valued by your employer, incentivized by the ref, is a narrow set of academic outputs, papers and patents, that's what the ref has been valuing. If you step off that pathway for a while and you go and work in the third sector or something, it's hard to come back. So REF 2028, or whenever it's going to be, it will be 28, I think, I think is doing a really good job. I'll stop there. Thanks, Paul. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Rory. And I, I think that um, just as you were talking, it reminded me of this, a survey called the CEDARS survey that some of you may have heard of, the Culture, Employment and Development of Academic Researchers survey that Vito run. And there was a statistics in that that really jumped out at me. Only 16% of the people who were who were surveyed had had experience of other sectors, which I thought was really low. You know, so most of the workforce and the academic workforce has spent its whole life working within higher education. Only 7% had had a placement and 56% of people surveyed were really keen to have that kind of experience themselves. So I think that just reinforces your point. It's, it's actually yeah. worth looking at the NCAP data set. If you look it up, it's freely available. There is uh, uh, another thing that holds people in their careers, of course, in, in a narrow pathways pension scheme. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's come to Tim and then Amanda will have the final word on this topic. But I, I, I'm probably not going to answer the question of improving KE culture, given that I've already stated I don't know that I explicitly believe in it. Um, but <laughs> I guess kind of the, the resonating with a lot of what I've heard already that, again, my experience as an academic coming through the ranks and the kind of you play by the rules of the game, as Rory said, the ref had inadvertent impacts and effects. There's the comply or die, publish or perish. Um, and I guess my view was that I did what I needed to do to allow me to do what I wanted to do. And that is something that in the position that I'm in now, it's trying to afford that and take those principles and build that into the the system for others. And I suppose in answering the question, trying to think about it at three levels and I guess kind of improving KE culture. Well, certainly KE interventions and the kind of the, the visibility of KE and, and the importance attributed to it. I think at a systems level, first of all, uh, the structure of funding changes has been instrumental. So if you look at something like the ISCF, and what that did for emphasizing the importance of knowledge exchange as well as research and actually trying to validate and value that i think that that had a big impact so um i think that um funders do a lot more than funding um and i think that it's trying to recognize that and and and, and really kind of acknowledge that change that has been seen and experienced and again as a beneficiary of that um, I, I've seen the money that I would kind of typically buy for going from tens of thousands of pounds to hundreds of thousands of millions, as there is recognition in that space that this is something that's really important. So in driving systems change and at that systems level, um, what's gone on within UKRI, the work with Bayes as was, DC as is now, um, hugely important. Um, I agree with everything that colleagues have said at an institutional level at Brooks at the moment, very much involved with the kind of respecking of career pathways, looking at how we acknowledge uh, all aspects of the academic role uh, at all levels. It's not something that should simply be there for the professoriate to go in a particular direction. The dichotomizing between teaching and research is equally problematic. We want academics that um, are able to take advantage of this porosity. We need to be able to 
equip and skill them. So as well as the career pathways, one of the things that I think is really important is the development. And how do we support individuals recognising um, those more senior researchers may not have any real um, experience in engagement. Um, we look at some of the DTPs, CDTs at the moment, the kind of doctoral training networks, uh, and actually engagement is, is at the heart of lots of those now. We see um, the way in which they're reviewed and, and having been on panels around that, it's hugely valued at a much earlier stage in the career. And, and that really is, I suppose, kind of, if I was to concede and acknowledge a KE culture, uh, where we need it to start. We need to turn the tanker around. It's a slow process, but if we're investing across um, the career trajectory, not just in the progression, the recognition and reward piece, but in the development piece, I think that that's hugely important as well. Um, the, the third element, and I mentioned the Innovation Caucus, which is now the Innovation and Research Caucus, and, and I think um, Jess will later share the link in Padlet for that, that people that are interested. We're very much looking at the research and innovation system. We focus on academics from different disciplinary backgrounds, bringing insight to the likes of UKRI, Innovate and ESRC. Um, but when it comes to the KE culture, although we are a KE investment and we work with a huge number of very um, bright and academically esteemed individuals, the challenge is often in spanning the boundary. And I think that this expectation that because your research is cutting edge, you can put that in the right forum and format for particular individuals working in UKRI or DC is, is a massive kind of myth that we need to bust. Um, there's nothing wrong with not being able to do it, but we need to build capacity. Um, one of the most kind of formative developments in my career was the 12 months that I spent in um, the Department for Business kind of 15, 16 years ago now, and, and working in a way where you had to produce things for the minister's box at the end of the day, you were told they're not going to understand that. And then the minister changes and all of a sudden they want it written in longhand in kind of line and a half. You, it's it's that agility which academics are not accustomed to working to. So we need to kind of make them aware of what the expectations are. Um, but it's not just on the academic. The flip side of that, with the Innovation and Research Caucus, we're working with colleagues within UKRI to help them build capacity. Because it's one thing having the knowledge to exchange or transfer as the kind of the, the old term was, but the absorption question is another challenge. How do we get people to absorb and understand the knowledge that we're trying to exchange and put into their organisations for their benefit when some of them are not um, willing recipients of this? They're busy, they've got jobs, they need an answer. Um, and the one thing that I, I guess colleagues at Innovate would kind of, it'll probably be on my epitaph, where it says... Um, you're not asking the right question. And actually, to be able to talk to a civil servant or someone in a government department and say you're not asking the right question, you can't leave it there. You need to be able to develop that and help develop their thinking. So a lot of the project work with the Innovation Research Caucus is also concerned with building capacity in the system, both at the academic end, but also um, in the beneficiaries end. And I think there's so many grants and, and kind of big awards out there at the moment across all of the UKRI funders that, that that shouldn't be overlooked. This isn't an academic problem. And if we were to improve knowledge exchange and the culture of knowledge exchange, it means being able to drive cultural change beyond our own organisations. And I think that that's a really kind of important takeaway. Yeah. And I think I'm sure lots of people in the room will, will really um, agree with you there, Tim. I think we work very closely with public engagement experts, professionals who work within universities who, you know, I think are enormously important in kind of as members of teams that are bringing together expertise in different modes and agilities and methods of, of engaged practice. So for me, it's very much about the whole kind of collaborative structure that we have within the university and how we value those different modes of expertise, technicians, professional staff, academics, but working in a much more equitable way. But Amanda, I was going to come to you last, and I just wondered whether you would mind perhaps reflecting a little bit on the KE Concordat, actually. Did that help you with your goal to improve KE culture? Because I think it was meant to. Certainly, I think in many ways that's the way we approached it at York. So we knew that we wanted to improve KE culture. 
And actually what we saw was that the Concordat provided us with a framework that we weren't obliged to follow, but we could review, amend, implement in the way that we felt was most appropriate for the university. So I think there was a bit of kind of Concordat overload at one when, when the KE Concordat came out. So I was very aware within the institution that coming along to senior managers and go, hey, here's another Concordat we've got to do, was not going to kind of drive anybody kind of to be enthusiastic. In fact, it might drive them over the cliff. Um, so I, I took the view of actually nobody needs to really know much about the KE Concordat, but what I can do is use that as a basis to say to the university, okay, what do we want to improve? Um, and what are the core things that we see we are weaker in and the areas that we would like to develop? And so I kind of used the Concordat and, and, and developed with colleagues, a, a process for building a whole range of different interventions that would help drive and develop um, our cake or improve our KE culture. And a lot of it, as we've heard already, was around that kind of people agenda, kind of reward and recognition, um, the opportunity for people to move in and out of roles, etc. And I think one of the other key things that it allowed us to do was it allowed us to bring in both the academic community and the professional services community, because KE is often seen as something that PS professional, professional service professionals support academics to do. So we're kind of the drivers. And actually, it really should be the academics that are driving and kind of coming and knocking on our doors saying, oh, I'd like to do this. Can you help me? And so the way that I looked at it was by trying to get both a mix of academics and professional services staff together to say, OK, if we want to improve what's going to help the academics? And so we ended up with about 60 people on a working group around culture, both academics and professional service staff from across the institution. And I think that helped ensure that the interventions, the changes, the, um, the investment, the resources we were putting in to support culture change were ones that would genuinely support the academics. Because um, I think we're all very good at going, oh, we should, as professional services people, we should do this. This will make it much better because it makes it much better for us. Um, whereas actually, there is a massive need to make sure that the processes, the policies, the support we provide actually does facilitate what the academics are wanting to do. And it should be their agenda in many ways, not ours, because it's the research agenda. And that's the other thing, I think trying not to isolate KE outside of the research agenda because it is a continuum. And again, that's that's one of the things I'm kind of continually banging on about, that we must stop saying research and KE. This is all part of the same research, KE and impact. It's all part of the academics agenda. Um, and we, we must be careful about kind of stigmatizing KE as something that kind of, oh God, I've got to do a bit of KE. And actually, this is all part of what we should be doing and those opportunities to, to develop our research into ways that have an impact, to develop our careers in and out of academia, all contribute to that improvement in, in culture across the institution. I guess that's my perspective. Great, thank you. And that raises yeah a question about the future and about the REF and aligning of KE and research and impact etc which we'll come to in a minute but I just wondered Sam whether we could just touch base with you um, rather than expect you to walk us through everything that you've recorded just can you give us a sort of flavor of what you've taken from that conversation this was meant to be a kind of really practical conversation and it was I think about so what can you do to fix this thing called culture or to at least improve it and we've had lots of concrete examples but maybe we could come to Sam and just get a sense of what you picked up. I quite liked what you're talking about, sort of building um, networks to connect universities. Um, and it's all about sort of sharing ideas. That's the most critical thing. Um, and also sort of creating that social phenomenon as a result of it. Um, but also thinking about how you can develop new creative approaches to it. So try and think outside the box. Um, I liked what sort of um, Anne was saying about sort of dressing, um, dressing knowledge exchange up as something else um, and trying to sort of isolate it um where and sort of like seen as like secondary to being a researcher where in actual fact it should be sort of alongside it 
um, uh, what are we talking about? Uh, most people follow a narrow career path as well, and sort of the path that you go from key stage all the way up to PhD, and then um, a career path. What was quite funny how he talked about sort of once you join the university at 18, you never leave um, without having, oh, sorry, let me just move that into frame, um, without having ventured out and sort of tried other things and sort of particularly from like a working professional um, thing where you bring in sort of external um, external ideas, external experience um, to a university um, academic um, frame framework, which I think is quite important. Um, one of the points that I really liked is, is that um, engagement with KE is at the heart of maintaining KE culture. So it's about encouraging and nurturing sort of that community um, by building capacities for managing KE culture. So we have a bunch of people here who are basically um, working together to sort of build this container in which KE culture can be absorbed. Um, and so you can see here, there's uh, the visual sponge of absorbing, absorbing like a sponge. Um, also how we drive um, KE culture beyond our own institutions and how academics and professional services can come together um, to provide a more sort of um, community aspect to it. And I love your don't isolate KE, that little sad KE looking very <laughs> sort of lawn. So what we're going to do now is um, is just begin to look ahead perhaps to what's coming next. And Jess is just going to bring up a slide about REF 2028 that a couple of people have already just referred to. and. It's, and we've already mentioned that people, culture and environment is now planned to be 25%, although there's a lot of pushback about that as to whether that's realistic. Isn't it interesting that we no longer talk about research outputs, just picking up on Amanda's point, we now talk about contribution to knowledge and understanding. So the language between knowledge exchange and research outputs is kind of blending. And of course, in, impact is now engagement and impact. So the KE, the engagement, the exchange notion of what is involved in achieving impact is also more explicitly recognized so this is a very ke flavored new ref you could argue um, <clears throat> and i think that it perhaps makes us feel quite optimistic about the future if we think that actually there's a really strong push now from from ukri incentives being built into the system building on things that the panel have referred to that will really encourage us and reward us for working in these new ways. The first thing I just wanted to ask the panel about is just this really crunchy issue that is being talked about a lot at the moment, which is, can you actually measure research or knowledge exchange culture? Uh, and that's been, I think, a lot of the pushback against the 25% for people, culture and environment, that actually there are no robust ways to actually measure this. It's too loose, it's too fluffy, it's too vague, it's too complex. And so actually by putting 25% of the overall profile against something that isn't possible to actually properly, robustly and rigorously measure, we are actually making a mistake collectively. But I just wanted a quick response from the panel as to whether you think there are indicators of a good KE or research culture that you would feel confident could be used to help us assess our our performance as universities in supporting KE culture. And I, I don't know, Anne, whether you'd be happy for me to start with you and then to come to Martin, Rory, Tim, uh, and, and Amanda in that order. But yeah, Anne, any, could you chuck in two or three indicators that you think would be worth thinking about? Um, not on their own. I think the indicators will be relational. And I think it's mm. like it's like triangulating anything. You know, we if you triangulate quality on a research output, you're triangulating a whole series of things. It's not perfect. It's not a perfect solution. It's a judgment. And the same with impact and the same with environment. You know, it, it's about looking at a, a range of um a, a range of indicators and whether in the end, when you triangulate them all, they will stack up. And and one of the things I just say about the I think one of the things that REF 2028 does is really reinforce the fact that you don't deal with output separately from impact, separately from environment. They are actually interrelated and the, and you see the best submissions actually do that and cross-reference and you can see it kind of joining the dots. If you treat it like an audit and you do it in a transactional way, you get a transactional answer. And I think the, the the thing that's really interesting about the the push at the moment is it does raise all of those questions about relational data and actually how we use data intelligently rather than um, individual 
individual metrics. And that's as true for outputs, impact and environment, actually. I, I, Thank I, you, I, think we, I think I think I think we're over over exercised about that, and I, I'm quite supportive of what we're doing. Yeah, and having chaired two ref sub panels, you know what you're talking about, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Yeah, Martin, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I was just reflecting on what I was saying. I think I'll we'll go along a lot with a lot of that as well. So, um, yeah, we can have indicators, of course. Um, which are often transactional the indicators are, are something happening that you know perhaps people are doing more of or what it is you want want to measure because then you have to think about why, why uh, or any, any perverse incentives in the system there have driven people to do more of the thing you're measuring so let's say on the research culture as opposed to a ke culture measure you know if one you know, indicator of, of a of a research culture is Increased rate of publication, possibly you know the the the, the perceived quality of those publications. Okay, you might think it's a good thing, but it could be a negative research culture that's driving people to, to do more of that at the expense of something else, including sort of personal health and well-being. Say you know, so that that's that doesn't 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 tell you very much other than the people are doing more of it. If the triangulation point, I think, is very important. Impact. If we think about impact in, in the way that, you know, in, in ref impact, but impact more widely is a consequence of or, or it's linked to how one individual organisation um, relates to its own environment and context. And those are the three things that go together. And if you've got a, got a, got a uh, uh, um, perhaps, you know, coming back to what I was saying earlier, uh, a, a culture of reflection and learning and uh, um, constant revision with an institution the, in that triangulation will, will perhaps be a healthier way uh, to, to assess uh, uh, outputs and to assess um, uh, the, the, the health of one's institutional culture. Great, thank you. Rory, have you got any indicators up your sleeve that you would uh, recommend? So, um, I actually really liked Anne's, Anne's piece. I think it's completely correct. If you, if you, treat, if you treat REF like an audit, then you're gonna, you'll get one answer back. It is obviously there are lots of factors that we have to look at. But I think it's it's also very important for us to just bear in mind that what's, what's proposed in REF 2028 isn't a hard metric-driven measure of culture, because there isn't one. It's people, culture, and environment. We've already navigated environment. We understand environment and what sort of things we ought to be looking at. And we've already talked today quite a lot about different ways of supporting people. Um, so I don't really fear this at all. In fact, I'd very strongly welcome it as a step from researching the Duke era. Great. Thank you. Tim, any reflections? Again, I'm kind of shy of, of throwing indicators out there because I think that they, they are relational and I, I agree with Anne's point entirely. I think that being in a business school, we are accustomed to playing the accreditation game in different ways. And I actually think there's certain things that can be taken from that that are relevant when it comes to the KE um, kind of portfolio more broadly. And I guess kind of two of the things that we look at, one is staff sufficiency. And staff sufficiency sees us, for better or for worse, I'm not saying it's a good thing or the right thing, but attributing the types of academic and their activity to um, different buckets. One of the things that we're trying to do, um, which is an internal indicator, is very much getting people to think about theory of change using a logic model without using the term theory of change and logic model how do we get them to plot and to plan what the impact what the engagement is and what the outcome is and how we can support them to do that better so um i think that there is a difference here between what we might want to be careful in asking for as external indicators versus what are really helpful internal indicators in helping us kind of further the, the ke agenda Great. Thank you, Tim. And Amanda, just any reflections from you on this? Yeah, I guess from my perspective, I think we definitely, do, and I fully agree with what Anne kicked off and everybody else has, has, has said. Um, we don't want to be kind of studied by metrics and try to kind of add metrics to this, but I, I, I still think we are all looking at this within our institutions and wanting to improve the culture of our institutions that that somehow we need we need to be able to measure that improvement in some way and be that a kind of a narrative improvement that we can kind of say 
it, it feels better people are doing more rather than having metrics but i do i do think we need to be able to justify the investment be that time or money and resources we're putting into this activity by showing that it is making making a difference so i guess for me it comes back to the original question how are we going to measure without measure without measuring this how are we going to show real change and it might be through that impact agenda that that we're we're having more of an impact that that our research is, is genuinely making a difference outside there may be other ways of doing it, but i do think we need to think about that and i think we also do need to think about that internal culture of inclusion diversity and all those elements and, and some of those we can measure and we should be measuring are, are we having more people from diverse backgrounds winning funding being supported to write grants coming into the sector etc so I, I, th I think there are some things that we probably should measure but at the same time we shouldn't be just controlled because as you say what 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 you count you measure gets monitored sort of thing so but I do think we need to have that balance of some things we do need to kind of check that we genuinely are improving such as the diversity agenda but others it is much more iterative and, and, and the narrative that goes around the value of our research and what what difference it's making great thank you so we are drawing to a close and i i think i just wanted to end really by perhaps picking up on, on things you were reflecting on a little earlier amanda where you said there's a kind of an aligning of ke with research engagement impact i think personally I, I feel very optimistic about the future when i look at the ref and the framing of it but i also feel realistic and and slightly um i guess a number of people have commented it is really slow to get change to happen and it's really hard to shift how universities do actually work so there's a mixture of idealism optimism and and, and realism in in how i'm feeling about the future but we have created a final mentimeter poll to see what your mood is and hopefully we made you feel more optimistic um we should have done this at the beginning and now at the end but yeah the poll um the link is in the chat and this is asking you how optimistic are you feeling about the future of ke oh there's a few people who are who, who match my optimism when i'm feeling really particularly naive and idealistic of a five <laughs> yeah i'm going to ask the panel to close really now with some reflections on yeah, I guess perhaps what you're seeing here, but also what you think about the future and what would really help us kind of move KE culture forward. I, I guess just a couple of thoughts that, that we have talked about those collisions. And I guess that for me, serendipity is a capability as well. And we need to develop that capability in colleagues. And then when the opportunity comes up, they can deploy it. So I think that there is an onus on us as institutions to try and push that forward and, and, the development piece is as important as the recognition and reward piece. So I think that that was one. Second one, um, I think we need to recognise that more and more things in the contemporary academic environment need to be a team sport. Um, I say this as a social scientist where we are particularly bad at team sport um, and we need to try and think about the KE agenda as part of um, the teaching, but also part of the research. Um, and I guess the final thing and, and where my kind of PVC portfolio fits and even at the, the faculty level with the business school is working harder and trying to be more successful at aligning individual and institutional interests. I think if we can get that right um, and it will take many different forms, then we will we will be moving in the right direction. I, I do agree with Tim about it's a, we need to ensure this is a team sport. One of the one of the big challenges with REF over the years is it's actually become the opposite of a team sport. Universities feel that there's a, a, a fixed pie of money, which is a fact, actually. It's a zero-sum game. You often see after REFs, um, you know, various league tables, obviously, but the term market share is often in there. Um, who is who's who's gaining and who's losing? And when it comes to um, things like culture or people, people, culture, and environment, we've got to break out of that. Um, and I think there's a really big opportunity for us to all pull together across the sector and um, begin to articulate examples of good practice, 
where things we can see are working and share those. Yeah, well, um, first of all, I, I was one of the people on the more optimistic end of the voting scale, that, <laughs> uh, the one, one we just saw. Um, um, part of the reason for that is, you know, it, it's quite a specific thing, which of course is going to have some challenges. But it's more to do with the student and educational side and how that in, uh, of, of university's role and how that interacts with knowledge exchange. But so, for example, with the introduction potentially of things like lifelong learning entitlement, with all the, the organisational and sort of ministry of challenges that might bring, nonetheless, that's going to change the audience that we have. It's going to change, it, again, the sort of the demographic of the people that universities interact with, 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 with a fresh audience who, who will come with another set of expectations, experience and, experience and demands of universities, whom one of the roles of knowledge exchange is always to infuse the whole university work, research and teaching and knowledge exchange across the board with outside influences, as we've all been saying, and the, and the people that we then teach and who leave our institutions every year going out into the world, having been immersed, you hope, in that, that very... Uh, stimulating experience. So, with things like LLE and as other other you know educational mechanisms are available, um, you know that's going to change the people we're working with, who are potentially you know uh, uh, ambassadors for us and people who are spreading our influence in, in ways that we can't necessarily do ourselves. So that that's one of the reasons for my sense of optimism. If we can make the mechanic of mechanics of that work right. Great. Thank you, Martin. Anne. Yeah, I mean, building on what Martin said, really, I, I think we've all got finite resources. However rich or poor we are, the, the, the resource is finite. And it, it, it swings between education, research, knowledge exchange, and everything else we have to, to deliver. So I think the relational nature of those things is really critical and impact probably drives an awful lot of that. So we get research intensives. I think we'll see more impact intensives. And I certainly work in one at the moment where actually, if you read the if you read the, the narrative of the, the strategy, it's an impact-led institution. It doesn't say that on the team, but that's what it's doing. And John is right. I think the other thing I'd say is, Hey, like many things, and I'd say this about impact too, are different skill sets. Recognize them and reward them. You know, they're not the same. It's not the same skill set that necessarily likes to do research. And the contribution of both is, is vital, and we should recognize it in forms of, um, of proposition. And, and the last thing I'd probably say is instead of, and I, I feel very strongly about that kind of sense that we use the things that we're we have to answer the ref, the TEF, the KEF, all of that. We use, we look at what those things do and use them. Don't don't treat them as audits and set up parallel universes to do it. Use the very devices that we're asked to answer creatively, institutionally. And I think it would take out an awful lot of bureaucracy and an awful lot of pain, particularly, well, for all communities, actually, academic and professional um, in that sense. So I think it's really to do that. Thank you, Anne. And Amanda, your your sort of final thoughts. Yeah, I love that impact intensive university. I want to be one of those. I think we're going to have 150 universities all with that as our, our, our logo. Well, I hope so, because actually that's, that's where I feel very optimistic in terms of this whole agenda is so important going forward. But I think the changes are little steps. Um, I, what you, you ask kind of what is, is there one big thing that would move this agenda on? I'm not sure there is. Uh, I don't think there's a single, one single, if we all did this, we would move on. Um, I think it's lots of little steps, but I think lots of little steps focusing in on where we want to get to, which is to become an impact intensive university. Great. I, I, as chair's privilege, I guess I would, I would say actually, I, don't particularly want to be an impact intensive university I want to be an engaged university and that's what we've been banging on about at the NCCPE for 15 years is is it's through that engagement that that impact and that knowledge building and that curiosity will be will be actually brought to their full kind of potential but anyway <laughs> let's go for it uh, it's been really lovely to just tune in I think we need to come to Sam
any sort of final reflections on the on the last leg of our epic journey through knowledge exchange culture what have you what have you found well it's nice to see that everyone is so enthusiastic about the future of it um everyone seems to be really sort of engaged with the idea of pushing it forward and see how it can be developed in the future um i like to sort of the conversation around sort of how you measure um key and research and um you know judging if the research uh, the quality of the research is good um but also the factors that go into it and that the indication uh, indicators are relational to what's being um outputted um using a logic model um is a great way but also justifying an investment um into ke uh, and using diversity and inclusion as a good basis for uh, or as a good uh, metric for measuring um ke culture um, in terms of sort of optimistic about the future, I really like the idea of um, uh, what Tim was saying about uh, being a team sport. Um, we can see sort of this KE sort of being flung in the air by um, by his uh, supporting cohorts. Um, and that sort of the changes are a lot of little steps, but those little steps will then amount to bigger um, uh, things. As, as I sort of point out here, it's, it's, it's slow to make academic change as evidenced by this KE snail. Um, <laughs> But the changes, um, although they are a lot of ste a little steps, they will eventually mount up um, and push towards something that's a bit more optimistic. Great. Wonderful, Sam. And what a joy to have you with us today. Thank you. It's just brought a really fresh perspective. So really appreciate all your help. And I'm sure all of you uh, in the audience uh, who joined us for this will want to thank this um, fantastic panel. <laughs>